be honest, it's like one of my biggest fears, you know, losing your freedom. I mean, a lot of people go to prison and end up getting in more trouble uh, than they, for what they originally went in for. It's, but yeah, losing my freedom is the, the main one. That's something that's worrying. Ellis Corio walking into court here was one of 6,000 people charged with growing cannabis last year. In the end, he wasn't jailed, but given a suspended sentence and community service. Do you wish that none of this had happened in the first place? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, obviously, yeah. Uh, but it has, you know, so you have to deal with it, I suppose. Cannabis is by far the most popular illegal drug in the UK. It's still used by more than 2 million people each year. Now the law here is meant to be reasonably clear. Cannabis is illegal and producing or cultivating the drug can lead to up to 14 years in prison. So it's not the law itself which is proving controversial at the moment, but the enforcement of that law by both the judiciary and by the police. Last month, the police commissioner for Durham caused a fuss when he said his force would stop arresting people growing the plant for their own use. Are you going soft on drugs? Absolutely not. The, the community say we want to tackle the organised crime gangs and we do that. Police officer warrant! What then of those criminals who grow the drug to make money? Over the last decade, millions of pounds of police resources have been put into the fight against large commercial cannabis farms but this programme has learnt that faced with budget cuts, that may be starting to change. I mean, this was, it, it looks like a lot, but it's just the plants are allowed to grow to, well, quite a substantial size. We spoke to Ellis Corio again after his court appearance. He started growing cannabis for his own use, then for friends, then met someone with criminal connections. They rented this house in the suburbs and started to grow the drug commercially to sell through dealers. It's high reward and low risk. You know, you compare the sentencing you get for growing cannabis compared to the sentencing for other crimes, you know, dealing hard drugs or robbery or the kind of things that people do to try and make a quick buck, you know, and um, you compare the sentencing and it's very minimal for cannabis. But did you ever worry about the morals of selling it at all? Because it, you, this was making you into a drug dealer. Kids could be getting hold of it, anyone could be getting hold of it. Well... That's happening regardless. If you're making it easier. Well, in that respect, you know, if no one grew it, no one would sure, take it. Sure. Uh, in that respect, I suppose, you know, I can feel better about the fact that I never supplied any children with cannabis. That you know about? That I know about, yeah. I mean, that's why I think it should be legal, because if you're selling it in a, in a coffee shop you know, and you have to provide ID to get it, then you, you're eliminating that, that risk of it getting to children. But at the moment, like I say, the, the guy that decides whether it's OK for your kids to smoke is, is the guy on the street corner, and if the kids have got the money, they get the drugs. It's that simple. What's interesting when you speak to people who grow cannabis on this scale is how little they're worried about the police. A bigger concern by far is the threat of violence from criminal gangs and organised crime. Usually you get a knock at the door, you open the door and before you've even got a chance to speak or say anything, they burst through your door and they're pinning you to the floor, holding a knife at you or something like that, you know. It's easy money for them, you know, it's an afternoon's work for 10 grand. And who would you worry about more, those career criminals or the, or the police? Typically I would worry about those guys more than the police. It seems like... Whenever the police do catch someone for cannabis, it's not through their policing that they've caught them. You know, it's, it's something else. We wanted to find out what the police are currently doing about those larger commercial sized cannabis farms. The, the latest figures we've got are a good three or four years out of date. So we went back to the police and said, look, when are you going to release more up to date statistics? At first we were told last November, then it was in the spring, then the summer, and at the moment we're being told September at the earliest, which is almost a year later than originally planned. 
So we sent freedom of information requests to all 45 police forces asking about larger cannabis farms. That's those with at least 25 plants or sophisticated growing equipment. Between 2008 and 2012, there was a sharp increase in the number raided as criminals stopped importing the drug and grew it here instead. But our data appears to show something has changed. Of the 22 police forces who responded in full to our request, 16 had seen a fall in raids and detections over the last year. In many cases, that drop was dramatic. In London, the number was down from 203 to 140. In Liverpool, down from 613 to 504. And in Thames Valley, the number has more than halved in just four years, from 97 to 42. A similar pattern is found in other police forces across the country. But again, it will depend on the number of The drugs researcher Matthew Atha has worked as an expert witness in more than a thousand cannabis cases. One of the main methods of detecting cannabis grows is police helicopters with infrared cameras. They cost money, they cost a lot of money to keep in the air, and I suspect budget cuts will be falling on that type of operation. Also where they're doing things like chasing the money in a, in, in a sort of network of financial uh, transactions from, uh, from known dealers. So that type of proactive policing, I think, is, is probably being reduced, which will reduce the number of people who are actually arrested for uh, cannabis cultivation offences. The police do accept that budget cuts are responsible for at least some of that fall, but say the drugs market is complex and there are other factors as well. Criminals may be changing tactics. A number of large underground cannabis factories like this one in Somerset have been uncovered recently, making it harder for the police with their heat-seeking cameras to spot them. Some people are going to look at these figures and think, look, the police are giving up here. They're giving up on cannabis as a drug. The police are not giving up. Cannabis is illegal and we will continue to enforce the law. Now, we can't ignore the fact the police forces have had a 25% reduction in their government funding over the course of the last five years. And what that means is that we must focus our resources clearly on the priority areas. And serious and organised crime is a key priority for police and law enforcement. And we will continue to tackle these gangs. The problem for the police is whatever message they send out, it's not clear the criminals are listening. What's your family name then? Barnes. Barnes? Yeah, B-A-R-N-E-S. Jamie Barnes, here on the right, has smoked cannabis all his life. He got involved in dealing the drug in his teens. You have three whites whilst in this police station. He's standing in the custody suite at a police station in Essex after getting caught with dozens of cannabis plants in his flat. No, 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 you listen to me. I'm not here to cause any controversy. You should come to my flat, kicked my door off, damaged my property, took my stuff, I come from Dagnum and there's a saying in Dagnum that if one half of, if one half of Dagnum's selling drugs and the other half's taking them, leaving school it was a lot easier to go and get an ounce of weed than it was to go and get a job. It Just security, money, um, I had nothing else. I, I still haven't got nothing else. I've got no qualifications, no trade under my belt. Um, yeah, it was just security and money. When police smashed down the door to his council flat, they found almost 50 cannabis plants. They were weeks away from being harvested and sold to a local drug dealer. And how much money could you make with that amount in your flat? Yeah, I was looking to make about 30 grand from that 48 plants. That was like three months work. And the caution is you do not have to say anything, but it might harm... In his police interview, he had little choice but to admit the drugs were his. Again, there was no prison sentence. Earlier this year at Crown Court, he was given a suspended sentence and probation. I worried more about the thieves than I did the, um, than the police, to be honest. If the, once the police get involved, you know that it was my council flat I was doing it at, so I, know that, um, I knew that my flat was going to be taken off me, which it was. But that was my council flat gone. Now I'm back at my mum and dad's house. I was just gutted. I, I knew I was going to lose everything. Do you regret doing it? I do. I regret getting caught. I don't regret. I don't feel guilty for doing it. There's no, there's no element of that. Um, I do to some aspects. Yeah, obviously I got caught, but I mean, if I if I could go back and do it again, I would have just done it smaller. That's all I tell myself now. Is why didn't I just do it smaller?
With so much money at stake, the best the police can hope to do then is keep a lid on the cannabis business and the violence that goes with it. With cuts to police budgets and conflicting priorities, their job may be starting to get more difficult. Listen carefully and you can even hear it breathing. These extraordinary pictures come from a small camera fitted into the rhino's horn by British scientists. They hope it'll be a key weapon in the fight against poaching. 